We are officially recording. We are officially recording. So welcome everybody to the Open Education Network and today's session on the Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for OER. The name of our session is Opening Up Publishing Practices and Policies, Integrating the Code of Best Practices into the Work of the OEN Community. Today's session is 90 minutes. We'll spend about the first two thirds on content and the last third on your questions and conversation. There are also two follow-up forums scheduled because this has been a very popular topic in the past. And so we want to allow plenty of time for scenarios, case studies, and other conversations. So you are invited to return April 21st at 2 p.m. Central and again on May 12th at 2 p.m. Central, and we'll of course be sending out reminders about those sessions. Today's presenters are Will Cross from North Carolina State University, Meredith Jacob from American University Washington College of Law, and also from American, Peter Jazzy and Prue Adler. So without further ado, I will thank our guests and hand things over to them. Well, thank you um, so much for having us. Uh, Karen and Barb and the entire OEN, and thank you to everybody who's online for taking the time to join us today. Um, I think we're going to try to um, see if we can beat the clock on the distribution of time and talk for slightly less than two thirds and leave a little bit more. We're going to aim for almost half and half. Might be an aspiration, but we're going to do that. Because I think particularly for this webinar, the community at the Open Education Network is one where there's a lot of expertise and experience in using, creating, and um, supporting open educational resources. And so we really hope that a substantial amount of time in the second part of this meeting um, can be for that discussion and to really hear from people about their experiences, questions about the code, and questions about going forward. So what we're planning to cover today is in the first part to just introduce why we thought a code of best practices for in fair use for OER would be useful. Why we think you need probably both materials under fair use and Creative Commons licensed materials to create high quality OER. We're gonna talk a little bit why, about why the open education field is one that is well complemented by fair use, why this is an area where fair use is a really powerful tool. And then we're gonna get into the code itself and talk about what the code is, how the principles were identified and how they work in creating OER. And then finally, in what I hope can be sort of the meat of the session, we're gonna talk about how the code fits into the work of the OEN community and some ways that we think it might um, strengthen and enhance those practices going forward. So the first thing I think to sort of set the stage for this work is to understand uh, at least broadly the relationship between materials in the public domain, materials under a Creative Commons license and materials that might be incorporated under fair use when you're creating open educational resources. These three buckets of materials are all necessary, we think, to create high quality OER in most situations. The three different areas include materials in the public domain, which are works that are either out of copyright because of term extension. They could be works that were never subject to copyright because they are strictly speaking, not the stuff that copyright protects. So that could be that they are really facts. It could be that the thing you wanna use is an idea. It could be that it's an invention. All this stuff is not protected by copyright. And so it doesn't matter whether it was created yesterday or discovered 500 years ago, it's in the public domain because it is just out of scope for copyright. The second big bucket that I think most people who work in OER are very familiar with is Creative Commons licensed materials, stuff that is explicitly marked with a CC license. And that's really important because both for public domain materials and CC materials, you're free to use them in basically any way you want in the public domain completely free and in CC as long as you comply with the licenses. But both of those are going to be inherently limited by the scope of materials that fall into those buckets, right? Public domain is very powerful, but 
limited to materials that have either aged out or not been eligible for copyright protection. Creative Commons licenses, again, are very useful because they are clearly marked, they, are, they give you sort of laid out permissions, but only a tiny slice of existing cultural content is under a Creative Commons license. And obviously, in fact, only a tiny slice was even eligible to be because it was created in the 20 or so years since the CC, licensed exi CC licenses existed, right? So you've got this big gap between the time when in you know the 1925 and earlier works that are in the public domain and the CC licensed materials that have been created in the last 20 years since the license existed. And there's this core, core period of modern history that you might really need to engage with. And for that, um, we think the appropriate tool is fair use. So fair use is a limitation, is in this sort of big bucket of limitations and exceptions to copyright. And it is a user's right that gives you the legal right to use copyrighted materials as long as you um, sort of look at the analysis of the purpose for your use and the, um, the analytical tools to understand when fair use applies. So when you're sitting down to create your RER, it's not a sort of closed book exam. These three buckets of sources all feed into the information and the content in that OER. So one of the things that we found is in a few disciplines, it is really possible to create um, high quality and effective OER using only public domain and Creative Commons licensed source materials. In addition, of course, to your newly created content. But in many cases, and I think perhaps even in most, the use of some existing copyrighted materials through fair use is um, an enhancing and sort of pedagogical mission serving tool to create high quality OER. And this is, as we said, because all types and sources of materials are fair use eligible. Peter's gonna talk a little bit more about the analysis to understand when and how you can use them. And then because fair use allows all sorts of normal and necessary academic practices that you already rely on from quotation all the way up. That in fact, even though in some ways we're presenting this as you know, a big new idea that fair use allows you to do this, in fact, sort of under the surface, fair use has um, always been a part of academic discourse. The ability to quote something, the ability to comment on it, that these core academic things are in fact enabled by fair use. So having said that, I'm going to turn the microphone as it were over to Peter to talk a little bit about understanding what fair use is and how the best practices um, are a powerful tool for implementing that. So there are, there are a number of exceptions that are built into the structure of copyright law. And we're familiar with some of them, 108, 110, maybe we're less familiar with others because they apply only in, in, in technical areas that, that we don't have much to do with. But, but in addition to all of these kind of specific situational copyright exceptions, there is this one exception, the fair use doctrine, codified now in section 107 of the Copyright Act, which is general in its application, which isn't limited in terms to any specific kind of use context or any specific kind of user. Instead, as, as you know from, from reading it, section 107 describes a list of considerations that were already part of the doctrine of fair use before its codification in 1978. The section 107 says, well, you should consider the purpose of the use and you should consider the kind of material that's being used. And you should think about the amount that's being used and you should think about the market effect of the use. And, and somehow out of that, uh, series of, of, of considerations, an answer will emerge as to whether or not the particular proposed use is or isn't fair. That is, whether it is one that can be done without risk of liability for copyright infringement, 
even though it involves reproducing or adapting copyrighted material, which ordinarily might require a license or a permission. So that's the background. That's where things stood, um, you know, sort of <laughs> more or less about the time that I got into this business 50 odd years or so ago. But it, beyond that, it was all pretty confusing. And it wasn't absolutely clear that this fair use doctrine, which had recently been codified, was going to was going to amount to very much, to be honest, in the, the larger scheme of copyright law. And that, that uncertainty continued for a little while into the, into the 1980s, certainly. And then, for reasons that are, are interesting to speculate about, which we can talk about in a, in a future webinar, if anyone was is more interested in more about history, then something dramatic happened, and it started happening in the early 1990s, and that is that the, 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 the courts, eventually up to it, including the Supreme Court, sort of, sort of got their hands around this newly codified general exception to the copyright law and began shaping it into something that both was easier to understand, more predictable in its application, more accessible, if you will, to all of the, the beneficiaries who it was intended to serve. In the first case, people who are doing new creative activities that require the use of some pre-existing material. And then ultimately, of course, whoever the audience, whoever the the, the readers or viewers or students who are going to make use of those new created works may be. And so, and, and we're not making this up. This is, this, this is, this is easy to, it, let's go back just a little bit. Um, we're not making this up. This is easy to find in the literature. Right now, the, 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 the inquiry into whether a use is fair is really just, it, it boils down to sort of two questions. One is, are you doing something new with the material? Is it a valid, value added use? Does it address a new audience? Does it have a new purpose? Is it therefore transformative, the jargon term? And if so, are you using an appropriate amount of it? Not, not way, way too much. The fair use doctrine doesn't say that you always have to use the least possible amount in order to qualify under the doctrine, but it says there should be some proportionality, some, 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 some reasoned connection between what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the amount you use. And if, if both of those questions can be answered in the affirmative, then the use is almost certainly going to be considered a fair one. Uh, it would be considered a fair one if a court got a hold of it after the fact and made a decision about it, and it, it should be considered a fair use before the fact when you were considering whether or not to make it. And if those questions can be answered to the affirmative, then among other things, as the slide indicates, there won't be any meaningful market harm either because there will be no substitution effect, which is after all the only kind of market harm to which the copyright law or which section 107 of the copyright law actually looks. So there we are. We have a new dispensation and now we can move on to the next slide. We have a new dispensation of fair use, which is very, very promising, very, if I can, can use the sort of twist, give the little, the cliche, a little bit of, twi of a twist, very user friendly that emerges, you know, 1994, 1995. And then the question is sort of what, what to do about this, how to get the word out to all of the different communities of, of creative people who could benefit from it and whose ultimate audiences could benefit in addition. There are different ways of doing that. The one that the, the sort of the, the team of which we are a part has been pursuing over the last 16 years or so, it involves working with 
practice communities, people who were doing particular kinds of, 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 of creative or scholarly or academic work to develop best practices documents that are intended to provide guidance about how the fair use doctrine in general can be safely, reliably, and robustly applied in a specific practice context. And we've done this with a, you know 15 or so different, different groups over years. We started with doc filmmakers. We've, taught, we've done this with various kinds of archives and with different kinds of, of, of learned societies. And now we've done it, thanks in large part to the tolerance of the community of OER creators, which is the group that is targeted in the document we're here to talk about today. We've, we're, we, are, we have done it with that, with, I should say, with, by, and for that group, because when we started talking to OER makers about content and copyright, the first thing we learned, I learned it, I suspect others on the team knew it already, is that in order to make OER, good OER, you need access to a wide range of what we are calling in this document inserts, that is, snippets or excerpts or selections of copyrighted material that serve to illustrate or provide examples for learning materials to support and to help to support those materials and to help them stick in the student's mind. And these inserts can of course be from of any kind. Sometimes it's text, sometimes it's it's still image, sometimes it's moving image, sometimes it's music, sometimes it's computer software, all things protected by copyright, all sometimes things that OER makers may want to have available to them as inserts to make their materials better and more effective. And we, for reasons that Meredith already explained very well, Although some good inserts are available on open licenses, the newest ones, and some may be available because they're in the public domain, the oldest ones, there's a whole bunch in between, which are going to be available if they're available primarily on the basis of fair use. And if you have these inserts, there are a bunch of different things you can do with them. You can make better media literacy materials to try to combat the misinformation crisis. You can make more powerful language learning materials. You can make materials on any topic which are accessible and durable that can be accessed and used by students in all kinds of life situations with all kinds of life challenges. And that's why people told us they were interested in knowing more learning more about how to apply fair use in OER. Before we talk about how that plays out in this document, I want to say a word about how the past best practice documents have affected the communities and the work of the communities for which they've been prepared. In some cases, we've seen rapid, dramatic transformation of the field. Uh, today, a whole range of different kinds of documentary films are being made that could not have been made 15 years ago because of the discovery or rediscovery of fair use that was mediated by the Statement of Best Practices and Fair Use for Documentary Filmmaking, which was actually the very first of these documents to, to see the light. In other areas, the effects have been equally profound, but more quiet. So the, the 2013 uh, best practices document that was done under the auspices of the Association of Research Libraries has had a very, very far reaching effect on library practices on all sides of the desk, so to speak. Um, and it has been quietly but pervasively effective in influencing library institutions to change their practices to as to better fulfill 
their missions. And, and that's been true across a range of, 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 of university, college university and other academic libraries. So those are the kinds of experiences that, that makers, creators, the intended beneficiaries of best practices have had with them. There's another dimension to experience these experiences as well. We were, we were kind of apprehensive when we started doing this, that there'd be a sort of an explosion or a big pushback from, I don't know, movie companies or recording companies or publishers, others, you know, big, you know, organized rights holders with a lot of power and ec economic power and political clout. In fact, there's been almost none. Um, as we'll see in a minute, these are actually fairly middle of the road documents, which may help explain it. Whatever the explanation, these documents have basically passed into general use without any significant challenge from rights holders. And in some cases, we can talk about examples of this more if anyone is curious, rights holders have actually adopted these codes as de facto guidance for their own internal purposes. So we've seen them having enormously powerful effects in the field and meeting with almost no organized resistance for we think the simple reason that they're almost self-evidently correct and, and, and sort of un, you know, they're, they're very hard to, they're very hard to attack because they are so well founded. So going on from there, who we have another uh, discussion, and I think Meredith will come back to you. Yes, thank you. Um, so Peter has told you, I think, very helpfully how the codes of best practices can act as tools to sort of take the powerful legal foundation of fair use and translate it into. Um, sort of action-oriented guidance and uh, reinforcement and education for different communities. But having talked up the codes, I feel like it's my responsibility to now explain a little bit about what they are and what they are not. Um, and so, and how to use them. And so as the codes come out, we hope that they're gonna serve a, a couple of different purposes. And this code for the OER community specifically um, we hope it'll serve as a tool for institutional and individual copyright education. Um, the code itself talks about copyright and fair use a fair amount. And there are um, five different appendices that come with it. Uh, they're a gift with purchase. And uh, we, we think that the copyright information there will not a sort of survey copyright 101 contains pretty useful deep dives into different areas that you might need to think about to really understand the code. We also hope that in a very pragmatic sense, there'll be a guide and a tool to reason about when and how to apply fair use in particular projects and to understand and sort of recognize recurrent situations where the fair use analysis can, will be very similar time and time again, if you are doing the same types of pedagogical mm -hmm. and academic activities. We also hope that um, these might be a good way to talk to fair use, talk about fair use to colleagues, including those that function as um, either formally or informally as institutional gatekeepers. And our hope there is that they can be a way to sort of have a shared language of what you are talking about doing and why you might want to do it in those situations and not sort of have to start from scratch when you're trying to have those conversations. And finally, um, in the long run, we hope that they are a way to enable new projects and through doing that attract new people into the open education community. I think that, you know, the, the OER community has in a lot of ways these strong roots in the STEM subjects, in part because the copyright conversations there have seemed less formidable. And we hope that there are topics that may have seemed a larger reach for OER that seem more doable with these best practices. The code, because it keeps a tight focus on fair use 
and inserts into OER does not address a lot of broad copyright questions that come up in the course of education outside of the creation of resources. It doesn't talk about course reserves, classroom work. There are a lot of ways in which fair use enables activities in those spheres, as are documented in part by the ARL code, which Will just dropped into the chat, and other codes of best practices. But this code, for the purposes of being a reasonable length and addressing a sort of definable issue, focuses on inserting third-party materials into OER. Also, because we're focusing here on fair use, it isn't a handbook on how to get the most out of open licensing. OEN has some great uh, training materials about producing open educational resources. The CC CERT has a really deep dive into that, and all of the CERT materials are available for free under an open license. And we have not attempted to sort of recapitulate that here. And then finally, um, it does not include any sort of hard limits or prescriptions or formulas or ratios because those things are generally not um, particularly useful in taking the law and applying it to broad projects. They can be very um, easy to understand, which would be helpful if they weren't probably also wrong. Um, so unfortunately, the way the law is structured, there are many instances in which using a whole thing, a whole photograph, a whole haiku, a whole short story is fair use. And there are also other instances where we're using a very small amount of it is not. And so it really comes down to those two questions Peter referenced earlier, the is it transformative and are you using the appropriate amount? And we hope the code has given you some really concrete waypoints to understanding and thinking through those questions but we don't have percentages and that is because they are really not something that it would be sort of useful to estimate. Um, the other thing I wanna say is that this code in particular is a really consensus-based and centrist document and not a sort of um, call, to, call to arms, not a sort of radical manifesto that um, in fact, one of the things that was in the genesis of this is that I kept going out to OER conferences and talking about Creative Commons licensing. And then, you know, people would sit and listen politely. And then they'd have these questions about fair use. And they were questions that fell within the core things, criticism and education and commentary, the very sort of heart of what fair use is meant to enable. But I didn't have a resource that let me answer those in a useful and systematic way. And so what you see here is a document that, rec that really is operating in the sort of central part of a Venn diagram where we are in the sort of core mission of what the OER community is doing, creating effective and mission-driven pedagogical materials in something that is within our, our sort of most confident understanding of the law, our team of experts, um, and then finally, that has been vetted by outside copyright experts to sort of double check that math and to say, yes, this is in sort of the core reliable understanding of what the law, um, what the law allows. And so I think here it's important to say that even though the um, practices in the code may seem very broad, that is because we are operating in sort of the core area. Mm where fair use operates. And so that is, I think, reflected in the nature of the code. But I would say as you go forward, I would be reassured that this is not a sort of controversial area of fair use law. Um, because it is always satisfying to get to brag about one's friends, mm -hmm. I would say that we are not going to read the names or biographies of our illustrious reviewers, but they are in the code. Um, we want to thank them for their contributions, but also say that we worked, I think, to select people who come from really different positions in the copyright universe, um, in academia and in um, the general counsel's office and in different areas like that from the library community, so that we made sure this was an understanding of fair use that was broadly supported. To dive into the code, I'm gonna turn it over to Peter, who's gonna tell you a little bit about how each principle is structured and then introduce the first two.
Thank you, Meredith. If you, if you have looked at the document or when you do look at the document, as I hope you will, you'll see that there's some front matter background material, which we've more or less summarized up to this point. There are also, as, as, as Meredith mentioned, and as we'll touch on again in a moment, some what we think are as, as useful appendices. But the, the core, the heart of the code is a section in which we treat four recurrent situations, which informants from the, the OER community told us came up again and again and again and raised recurrent questions about whether and if so, how fair use might apply. And those four recurrent situations are addressed in the following way. They, they each, in each, in each instance, we begin with a, a, a use case, a statement of what this recurrent situation consists of, of the kinds of, of, of experiences on the part of OER makers that, that represent the, 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 the coverage of the, of the section. Then there's a, is a br usually quite a brief statement of a principle about the applicability, the potential applicability of fair use to that or those use cases. And then quite importantly, there is a section that says, but in applying the fair use principle to the use case, there are some things you need to take into consideration in order to arrive at a happy result about which you can feel confident and on which, so to speak, you can place significant weight. And then the fourth part of each of these sections of the, the code deals with what we were calling hard cases. By this, we don't mean we don't mean examples that are not covered by fair use. We mean examples that in order to determine their fair use coverage may require a little more thought, a little more concentration, a little more work in order, again, to arrive at a conclusion that you feel is robust and defensible and that can that you can go forward with. And maybe the best way to explain this is by illustration to start with the first section of the code, which deals with inserts that that terminology that I introduced earlier that are being used as objects of criticism and commentary. All, all sorts of situations exist. The, the graphic here is an example in which one might want to take something, a short poem, for instance, in the case of this, this E. E. Cummings verse, and lift it from its original context and place it in the new context of learning materials where it would be itself commented upon, critiqued, discussed, or explored. This is a very common example of this. This is a common instance of fair use beyond OER, beyond education, in fact. But it is one that within OER is clearly recurrent and important. And the it's it, the the codes makes the general statement of principle in the next slide uh, that these are all potential examples of fair use. And it does so in a way, I won't read the text, which you can do for yourself now or later. It does so in a way that is expansive rather than restrictive. It does so in a way that makes it clear that all kinds of of objects are potentially eligible for being treated as fair use when used as inserts. It does it in a way that makes it clear that offering 
an example for it, for purposes of gross criticism or commentary doesn't always mean that the author of the book, the author of the materials, has to do all of the critical work. The same rationale for applying fair use may apply with equal force if this object is presented as, an, as something which learners can themselves um, employ as an as an as as part of an a, a critical or a critical exercise, and so the principle, as I say, is very broad. And then, as we mentioned, there are these these considerations. Um, the first one is 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 pretty clear. I think that in order for this fair use for this of uh, this fair use principle to apply, there has to be some kind of there some has to be some kind of apparatus. There has to be some kind of of structure imply express or implied within the learning materials that enables the 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 that either evidences or enables the critique in question. Um, there is this issue of proportionality that I mentioned earlier. If I am, if I am discussing one short poem by E. Cummings, I probably don't want to reproduce the whole book of poems from which that one poem was taken because they are not part of the discussion. If you are going to have multiple examples, it's helpful if you can to draw on multiple sources rather than continuing to come back to a single source. And the last is interesting because it, it, it will mention it now, but it comes up. It's part of all of the sets of considerations accompanying all of the principles to follow as well. And it is, of course, that wherever possible, insert material employed on the basis of fair use should be used with appropriate or proper attribution. This is interesting because it's not really in the statute. It's not even really in the case law about fair use. But people in the community felt so strongly that if they were going to rely on fair use to incorporate insert materials, then they wanted to be sure that they were giving proper credit. Because it was such a strong conviction within the community, we tried to faithfully report and, and, and incorporate it here. Finally, the hard cases. Well, this is one that comes up, as you know. Suppose that that someone is interested in creating a, a critical anthology of material, copyrighted material, for use in support of or in connection with a, a course, a literature course, or a history course, as the case may be. Um, here, the, the, the questions are going to be more uh, acute because, among other things, there is at least some risk that such uses could have economic substitution effects with respect to markets for the copyrighted material involved. We think, and our, our advisors think, that there is plenty of scope for the creation of appropriate fair use-based freestanding OER anthologies, but we also think that these are projects that are going to require closer scrutiny than one-off examples of inserts incorporated into OER learning materials. And then we come to the next principle. And this is a very important one. If I had to bet, I would bet that in general, not just in OER, but, but more broadly, this may be the most common example of fair use in, in practice. And that is situations where third-party material, copyrighted material, inserts, as we are calling them here, are incorporated into a new text not really because a point is being made about them in particular, but because they serve as apt illustrations 
of a more general point that is being made, of a narrative that is being constructed, of a, if you will, a story that is being told. As here, neither of these two illustrations of, of of Hollywood, or I shouldn't say Hollywood, I should say motion picture versions of robotics is really being discussed in itself, but they are being used to display the fact that there is a continuity of, of uh, you know, a representational continuity over the course of 50 years in the representation of robotics in cinema. So it's a fine distinction, but an important one. It's on this basis that one might use a, an iconic news photograph in a history lesson, for example, to illustrate the phenomenon, the, 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 the urban insurrections of the mid 1960s, for example, that is being discussed in the text. There's lots of scope here the general principle which follows in the next slide makes that clear in its, in, its, in its categorical breadth. There are also considerations to be borne in mind, including those that are illustrated in the next slide, which deal not only with some of the same things that were true of or that applied to critique and commentary attribution, for example, but also include some items that are specific to the to illustrative fair use. The user ought to be prepared to explain why and how the image in question is supportive of the argument of the narrative and not merely decorative or 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 you know, superficially included for purposes of superficial attraction. There should of course be qualitative and, and quantitative appropriateness in the amount used. The range of references should where possible be spread out among or a variety of different sources. And the, the last consideration here is an interesting one. It's a reminder really that Sometimes there may be less to copyright in a, an object, a, a text image or whatever that is being considered for illustrative use than meets the eye. So if I decide that I want to illustrate a, a historical event by quoting from a contemporary newspaper account. Truth is, although that contemporary newspaper account may enjoy some copyright protection, it's probably very thin protection because it has such strong factual content. And the facts, of course, as we know, are beyond the reach of copyright protection in the first instance. So in assessing whether or not an a, a potential insert is available for illustration principles. You can also, uh, you, in addition to all of the other considerations, you can also say, you know, is this perhaps a case of thin copyright, where indeed the scope of fair use might operate more, or the where where fair use might operate indeed with a broader scope. Finally, then again, hard cases. Um, I think the the hard what we discovered that people have difficulty with in, in constructing rationales for the, you know, using, uh, using copyrighted materials illustratively is that the difficulties occur mainly in situations where the, the connection between the, the, the meaning of the object and the, the new context in which it is being inserted is not um, it, it, it's not a literal or, or overt one. So it's, it's, it's pretty easy usually to describe what connects a bit of a text or an image to 
the narrative of learning materials, it may be a little more of a challenge sometime to talk about, say, why a, a musical quotation would be justified on the same basis. But although this may be a little more, this may require, require a little more work, it's very much worth work that is worth doing because just to reiterate, one of the most basic premises of the code as a whole is that all kinds of copyrighted material are potentially covered by it. That fair use is in effect a, a, a unified field theory in, in context like this. And now I'll turn it over to Will, who will summarize the third and fourth principles. Thank you very much, Peter, and thanks everybody for being here. I also want to reiterate the call earlier. If you have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat box. We're excited to hear if this is making sense, if this is sparking anything for you as well. So please send those questions along. Um, so as promised, uh, the, the third example here, uh, it's not about commentary or illustration, as Peter discussed, it's about practice. It's about cases where open educators are using inserts to build analytical skills, familiarity, or fluency. So the example we have here is, is a question we heard a few times, actually. Someone bringing in something like this telenovela to help immerse students in the way a language, in this case Spanish, is actually spoken rather than sort of the stilted formal version you'll sometimes see in a textbook. I want my students not just to know, my name is Will, I go to the library, but actually how native speakers use the language in a different way. Um, we heard different variations of this type of question from folks in political science who wanted to think about bringing in newspaper editorials and op-eds to, again, sort of ground in the real practice of things. In all cases, though, th what these examples boil down to is creating an opportunity to practice skills and deepen insights by engaging with an insert that wasn't necessarily created for educational use. So we say that much more succinctly on the next slide. This is, I think, said very well here. Um, the practice itself, I think, make, I think, makes a lot of sense. And I'll, I'll say that the, the next slide talking about the set of considerations uh, sounds a lot of themes that Peter has already sounded for you. Thinking about grounding your work in the pedagogical values, um, presenting materials in a way that maximizes that value being prepared to explain the purpose and the amount. Why did you use this thing? And why is this the appropriate amount? Um, and then again, using a, a range of specific sources, not just drawing exclusively and excessively on a single source. Um, attribution remains an important principle in this space as well. Um, so those are the considerations. Moving on to the hard cases in this space. Um, this is another one that, that goes back to something that Peter said very well, which is that the, the hard here, the, the question that came from people here was less about uh, whether or not the law supported your practice, but whether or not you were going to get in trouble instead. Yeah. In other words, when you're using these what we call high value contemporary popular cultural inserts or materials, um, I think there's no question that fair use supports that behavior. But if I borrow five popular songs from the past six months, we heard some people say, whatever fair use is, I'm afraid somebody's going to get mad at me. So what we say here is not don't do that. Fair use absolutely supports that sort of behavior, but be thoughtful about the, the fact that you may get more questions. And so be better prepared to say, I'm confident in fair use. It makes sense because I'm doing this important work. It serves this purpose. Uh, it uh, addresses all those considerations that we talked about. And in that case, those hard cases can become much more comfortable cases. But, but a little extra thought, a little more critical analysis in those spaces. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth principle I like to call the sort of don't reinvent the wheel principle, right? This deals specifically with taking existing pedagogical content from educational materials that have in some way outlived their useful commercial lives, but, but remain protected under copyright law. So there's this great textbook from the 60s. Um, it's out of print, nobody uses it anymore, but it's got a really nice chart on verb tenses. I don't wanna reinvent that chart. And in some sense, it would be ridiculous to reinvent this sort of chart. I just wanna bring it in. Um, is that okay? And, and to those questions, we, we generally answered, yes, fair use exists in that space as well. Um, it would be ridiculous to sort of reproduce or to, <laughs> to not reproduce the structure of a popular 
a section on cell level metabolism along with examples because somebody did that 50 years ago and it's out of print, but I guess that's off limits now, right? This goes back to Meredith's, it's not a closed book exam idea. Um, so borrowing problem sets, borrowing examples, borrowing charts, borrowing pedagogical materials that are still protected but are out of print is sort of what the fourth factor deals with. Mm -hmm. um, and on the next slide, again, we say that in a way that I think is much more coherent and concise than I said it. Um, it is fair use. Fair use indeed supports that sort of activity. Um, and again, the, the set of considerations sound a set of themes that, that Peter has done a really nice job of addressing. Um, in particular, this idea that, that even before you get to the fair use analysis, um, you want to start with the sort of zeroth level step related to copyrightability. And I'm, I'm in the considerations here. So if we could bring that slide up, that'll be helpful. Um, so, so before you even ask, is this fair use or not? Ask, is this something factual that's not protected in the first place? Am I using such a small amount that a court might use the weird Latin phrase de minimis to talk about the amount of borrowing you're doing? Um, asking yourself questions about whether I even need to start a fair use analysis or whether the, the problem is solved before I get there. Um, and then the second set of considerations has to do with this question on um, the pedagogical value and the market harm that you're doing, right? Uh, the most common bad news we, we have to give people is when they say, there are three really popular textbooks, can I just take sections and squish them together and I'm done? Well, the answer there is no, because there's clear market harm, right? But when the work is out of print, when it's not available in those different ways, um, that's when this principle sort of looms the largest. So that consideration about market harm that we talk about in different ways and market substitution is really significant. And that feeds directly into the question about diversifying the range of sources, right? So that's, that's sort of the considerations. Um, the hard cases return to that set of questions about this sort of presumption of minimal market harm, that, that when your use is borrowing from something that is not available in the market, there's not a market substitute, you should feel pretty confident. The cases become harder and need a closer look when there is something like a straightforward licensing mechanism available. That's when you wanna take a closer look and really ask yourself, does this feel transformative? in the way that we've talked about. Does this mm -hmm. reflect the values in the principle or do I need to take another look and, and think a little bit more about uh, those questions? So those are the four principles. As I say, we, we wanted to, to do them well, but do them relatively quickly to have some time to talk about those principles. Please add those questions to the chat as they come to you. And I'm gonna turn it back to Meredith now to talk some about the values, signaling and appendices of the code. Thank you. And I apologize for the sort of back and forth on the slides. I'm having a cursor issue, so I keep clicking in them accidentally, but we'll make our way through. Um, as Will said, I'm going to talk about the, um, the sort of surrounding pieces in the code other than the principles and the um, sort of core part there, which includes the pieces that sort of talk about the values that surfaced in the process of authoring the code, the ways to signal when and how you have relied on fair use and how to understand the appendices that come with the code. So in the code and reflecting our workshops, one of the things that we found very important was to mark the instances of fair use that um, you have included in your OERs. And everyone agreed that marking, particularly in some cases, could offer really large benefits to downstream adopters of the OER. While all uh, determinations about inserts that OER authors make, including is this thing under a CC license? Is it in the public domain? Is it fair use? That you may need to sort of give a second look, give a sort of review to those as you do to the content itself. Is this an accurate explanation of the history of the 1950s and 60s, that all of that needs to be in scope for your sort of first look. At the same time, um, the fair use determinations that are made by a first author, if they are correct, are not um, likely to change in a sort of significant or material way just because that textbook is being edited or reused by a different author in the sort of same core way. That people talk about fair use being context specific, but that context is in the, why are you using this insert? Not, are you in North Carolina like Will or in DC like me, 
or do you believe that um you know Rothko versus Picasso was the pinnacle of modern art like those context questions are not the ones that necessarily affect your fair, that you assume do not affect your fair use determinations and so context is about those pedagogical purposes and is therefore um underpins a sort of reliable and repeatable fair use analysis for those points and so um it is important still for a later reader to be able to understand when you have relied on fair use. And sometimes that's going to be indirect. As we mentioned early on in this discussion, all sorts of quotations are routinely included in academic and teaching materials under fair use without any sort of special marking or disclaimer. The context of the text and of the citation makes it clear that those aren't the original authors, and that really meets that purpose. No one thinks that that quote that you ascribed to that third party author was somehow licensed for your article. That's not a worry. Um, at the same time, if you're using large sections of text, particularly perhaps as described in sections three and four of the code, when you're using them as resource materials or you're repurposing existing pedagogical content, it's really important to be clear on where that content has come from and that you are using it under fair use, that it's not newly authored and that it's not licensed. And that's important um, so that later users of your text understand both what your decisions were and that if they want to use those inserts in a completely different new context, then they would need to redo that fair use analysis for themselves. Um, so in addition to talking about that marking and signaling fair use, the appendices to the code cover a lots of different pieces of understanding the code and putting it into a context of copyright law. Um, I'm not going to explain what's in the appendices. They're um, in the code and I don't want to waste time for questions, but very briefly, they give you a background on uh, how we authored the, how we did the research and authoring for the code, the fair use law in the United States for about the last 55 years um, with a few dips farther back and um, a perspective on how other countries, even though they don't have fair use, all have a structure of limitations and exceptions to copyright law that allow many of these same types of core critical academic and discourse functions, whether that is in a fair dealing provision such as in Canada and the UK or in specific exceptions for education, quotation, or study. We did a deep dive in particular into the Canadian law um, in an appendix authored by our outside partner, Professor Karis Craig, because we know that the overlap between the US and the Canadian OER communities is really one of often one large community of practice. And we felt that it was really important to document that in fact, Canadian fair dealing law and US fair use law come to almost all of the same conclusions about what is permitted, even though the legal sort of logic and rhetoric under, underpinning it might be different, mm -hmm. um, though not always in the US and Canada. And so um, Professor Craig provides this really helpful appendix to say actually, in fact, that the things that are permitted by fair use are permitted by fair dealing. And so there isn't this sort of cross-border tension there that I think may have been a worry of some. And then finally, um, we have a sort of brief overview of the larger context of intellectual property law, how to think about the public domain, how to think about what ideas are not protectable, and then even a little dip into um, patent and trademark law to talk about how they might be, but mostly aren't really an important consideration for the creation of OER. The other thing that the code um, supporting materials talk about is the core values. And I wanted to um, introduce my colleague Prue Adler to talk a bit about the core values that we um, surfaced in these interviews that are discussed in Appendix 1. Prue, are you able to unmute and join us? I am, and thank you, Meredith. Can everybody hear me? Okay, yes. so um, welcome everybody. And 
part of what I wanted to summarize based on what you've heard throughout this webinar is that there are at least four key takeaways um, that we heard throughout this project. And importantly, they are all firmly grounded. And I wanna emphasize this uh, and consonant with the OEM's stated founding principles of equity, inclusion, humanity, and abundance. And we should emphasize that throughout all these discussions. And as you just heard um, from Meredith, there was deep consensus on the importance of attribution of sources and the clear marking of fair use inclusions or inserts. Um, we will focus on this more coming up in more webinars. Um, so stay tuned on that front. And second, secondly, um, fair use balances and equalizes creators and students and is central to insurance. It, it, it equalizes the playing field, excuse mm -hmm. me, for creators and students and is essential and central to ensuring equity and access. We heard throughout this project that members of the OER community support the goal of making OER accessible to all learners, including those with impaired vision, hearing or physical mobility issues. And that is something that has been emphasized with all of our conversations with the OER community. Um, but we also heard that concerns about using copyrighted materials resulted in at times less optimum OER, even if copyright inserts were the most appropriate and impactful. We also heard that selecting what was considered an inferior substitute leads to a, a less than high quality OER and it can limit the reach of OER and may undermine the overall purpose of creating the most beneficial, accessible and equitable resource for all learners. Um, avoiding fair use, we know, further exacerbates the inequitable, the inequitable of access by those with disabilities. And we all want to avoid that. We heard that through all of our conversations. With greater understanding of fair use, OEN members can create and adopt the most appropriate digital resources and provide more flexibility for others to adapt OER. Importantly, it allows for the creation of OERs that are more impactful and can better meet the needs of all learners. The reach is significantly greater. We heard this throughout all of our conversations. Finally, concerns about copyright compliance were high on everybody's conversations and they can limit the effectiveness with which OER makers employ inserts by slowing down new projects, driving practices, such as linking out of OER rather than incorporating inserts or copyrighted materials. The reduce, this reduces the effectiveness of durability of OER materials and the choices pose particular risks to students with disabilities and other access barriers. Um, so just going slightly deeper on the linking out, um, linking out in lieu of the most appropriate insert can be you know, text, visual, or audio is an example of key workaround. Such linking out can involve various online locations from proprietary wood, uh, websites to social media platforms. And it's generally perceived as being safer, which is not the case in terms of OER. And as we all know too well, there are a lot of broken links, a lot of change links, and these links can all lead students in unintended directions, which are not helpful. So part of what we have to focus on is that linking out in lieu of employing a compelling insert 
based on fair use may result in, in an inaccessible OER. And if a link resource is not accessible, it means that the student may have absolutely no recourse in having that resource become accessible as she has no relationship with the original provider. So for legal, moral, and ethical reasons, making OER accessible to students is not adequately met by reliance on linking. And through all of our discussions throughout this project, this was affirmed many times over. And I think we need to bring that home going forward with the ability of OER resources to be more accessible to the community overall. So with that, I will turn it, I think, to Will. Thank you, Prue. Um, so that's what the code is. And I think we did a pretty good job of saving about a third of our time to talk some about what you can do with it. Um, I think my remit here is to quickly set the table in, in a set of core areas around publishing practices and policies, um, and then hopefully get some good discussion going about exactly those topics here and then in the subsequent webinars as well. So I'll very quickly suggest a, a few things you can do as an individual at your institution and in the context of OEN as an organization, and then we'll get to the questions as well. Um, so the first and maybe most obvious thing is, is the code is intended to support the creation of new open educational resources. And Meredith talked earlier about using the code as a guide to reasoning about how to apply in the context of particular projects and recurrent situations. So when you're authoring materials, the code can empower you to, to publish in new, maybe more inclusive or meaningful ways. Um, as you work with others, you can bring in other new makers of OER projects as well to enable those projects. Um, and we hope we'll be able to support the publishing cooperative in whatever way makes sense as, as OEN supports that work going forward. So the, the make and stuff is the first thing that you can do. The second thing that the code can help you do is to update your practices in different ways. Um, I think Meredith and Peter both alluded to the way that the code is designed to raise your own confidence about copyright and fair use. So if you want to bone up a little bit, the code is a, is a nice part of that conversation, along with some of those other resources that we linked earlier on. Um, we also think there's space for guidance and training for others in your institution or in your field. Um, these webinars are maybe one example of that. We hope there will be others as well. Um, and then I, I know we've got several instructors from the certificate program on the call here. We've already got some plans to, to bring a conversation about the code into that space, but that's another great thing that OEN is doing that I think will benefit from these resources. Um, and then finally, we talked some about the idea that the code could be a way to communicate with administrators and gatekeepers in different capacities. So um, starting to rethink the standard guidance that you offer is an important thing to do. A theme that we heard sounded over and over was without any form of sort of external guidance, I feel like my only choices as a decision maker are nothing is okay or everything is okay, right? If I don't have anything to cling to, it's either slam the door shut, we can't do that, or if they say it's okay, it's okay. So we hope the code can give you a way to find sort of a happy medium between those places when you're speaking with people, when you're working with your administration and with your offices of general counsel. And we have a webinar in process with the folks at NACUA, which is the, the professional association of general counsel's offices to get them familiar with these resources. Um, and then as, as you rethink the institutional policies that are sort of written out and describe the way we understand and vet OER, uh, referencing and maybe incorporating where appropriate, the, the, certainly the values in the code and maybe even some of the practices in the code can be an important way to sort of update and improve your policy uh, to make everything that you do more sort of inclusive and equitable and impactful in different ways. So that's, um, that's a lot of us talking. And what we're really excited to do now is move on to sort of what's next. Um, we're going to keep doing work to localize the code into specific communities and disciplines. We're really excited to continue these, uh, this webinar series. We use this one to sort of set the table. We've got 20 minutes or so for conversation, and then we've got two more webinars to continue that, that process. So we've got this uh, form here, and I'll drop it in the chat as well, where we invite you to contact us. And that can be for webinar number two, I hope you'll talk about this or that can be, I'm part of an OER creation process and I really wanna have a conversation with you about what that looks like. However, we can connect with and help support your work. We're excited to talk about that. Um, so reach out to us through the forum and, and now I'll shut up and I'm excited to hear what questions you have. Thank you, Will. I thought that was a great um, 
a great introduction to sort of where we may go. I think um, we hadn't uh, quite finalized this before the webinar. Our hope would be to do these questions in the recorded part of the webinar so that they were available to later listeners. But I also wanted to offer that if there were questions that people felt were important to ask sort of off the record, that we could do a section of the Q&A that way as well. One thing I will say is that, you know, this uh, code has only been out there for a few months at this point. There are a lot of good and valuable introductory questions that have not been sort of asked and discussed and answered yet. So I would encourage everybody out there, if you have a question, to assume that it is not a question we have answered oh. in this webinar or to the public and that it'd be valuable to us, in addition, hopefully, to being valuable to you to bring those out there. There are things that are probably unclear or imperfect and we, we welcome any questions sort of large and small about what has been covered here. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the slide share so that the faces are a little bit bigger. Um, and the links that we've talked about earlier are in the, um, in the chat and those links will also be available in the slides themselves when they're released later. We have a question in the chat um, that says sort of, you know, how can this code be a tool to approach people who might feel really risk adverse and might not be considering fair use at all? Um, and then on the other end, how to use the code for people who in their OER authorship think that anything that they wanna use for the purpose of teaching is fair use. Um, I might take one quick stab at that and then turn it over to my colleagues for their opinions. I would say um, I don't encounter as many people who are um, unconcerned and sort of out there in their anything I want to do in education is fair use. But what I do, I think it has often been in a sort of situation where they're, what they're thinking about including their OER for use in the classroom is sort of mixed up in what they are thinking about including in their OER to share and redistribute to the public. And so I have often sort of stayed out of questions about fair use in the classroom because fair use is, you know, pretty expansive. And, you know, Peter O'Bell might talk about ways in which fair use in the classroom can let you do even more. I know less about that and we'll talk about it less, but you know, I've often said, well, we don't need to hash out whether or not that's fair use if you do it in your classroom. But if you wanna share this resource online in the public, then you should think through these guidelines. So for the sort of charge ahead folks, I would say, well, let's just do this check together before we put it up on the web for everybody. And at the other end of the spectrum, the people for whom fair use is a really big step, it's a scary thing to do. I have sort of two first points there. One is to remind people that there are some basic sort of introductory or sort of unlabeled fair uses that everyone does. And in fact, everyone feels like they have to do. It would be very hard to do responsible scholarship with no quotation, right? And quotation is not like a different part of the law than these other things we have been discussing. It is all in the same law. There is no, the word, you know, there isn't a special quotation provision. There are countries that have that, we do not. And so if you feel confident including quotations in your academic word, at some level you feel confident about some fair use. And so I would try to sort of introduce that piece um, that there is no sort of black and white keeping back from fair use altogether. The other thing I would really focus on is pedagogical mission. You know, are you committed to do, teaching the most accurate and effective version of what you teach? And if so, isn't the risk of doing lower quality teaching, of, com of compromising your mission, of reaching fewer students, of having less accessible materials, isn't that risk a real risk too? I can't tell you that we have zero risk in fair use. Life has risk. But there is also not zero risk in avoiding it. I always use, in K through 12, I always like the analogy that we let seventh graders do chemistry experiments with fire. And we have decided that you have to do that because it's how you teach them chemistry. And so 
every year some seventh graders go to the hospital because we taught them chemistry. No one ever goes to the hospital because of fair use. And so if we can tolerate that risk there, I'd say we can tolerate it here. Peter, Will, Prue, any perspectives on that question? Well, I would just offer the, the thought that I think whether, whether you're, we're talking about someone who's a little reluctant to, to enter into the fair use territory or that relatively exceptional person who actually may be a bit too bold, the code can function in the same way. The code is, as we said earlier, it's not a set of metrics. There are no percentages. It describes a thought process. You identify the instance you're thinking of as being one of several types. You, you weigh certain considerations, and through that weighing, you come to a conclusion. And that ought to be, that ought to be confidence inspiring for anyone who is reluctant, and it ought to be perhaps um, chastening for anyone whose thinking has been overbold. So it really, it, it should, if it works, and we have some evidence historically that it does work in, in other settings, if this approach works here, it should speak to both of those potential audiences. That's absolutely right. I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback on and say something Peter sort of already said, but the, the, one of the things I like about fair use in particular is, is the touchstone here is that good pedagogy by and large is good fair use. So this is not a, the lawyers said 10% is okay because right. they have a magical book that I don't have access to that says 10% is okay. This is like, what does good transformative teaching and learning look like in your context? What does a good textbook do? It doesn't reproduce the collected works of John Milton. It pulls the relevant materials and brings them in in a way that offers context. Exactly. So what, what we're asking people to do is to not become experts in the nuances of fair use. We're just asking them to be thoughtful about the stuff they're already experts in, how to teach in their discipline or in their field in a way that maximizes their own sort of creativity and imagination. Exactly. I, I often see people kind of unclench and relax a little bit when we talk That's in those good. terms. That our question is really, is this good teaching and learning? And if so, fair use is generally gonna have your back. And if not, I'll take another look. Well, then what is your teaching purpose? You know, I think that's often, we, Peter said earlier that the two questions for fair use are, do you have a transformative purpose? And are you using the appropriate amount? And if that transformative purpose question is question one, there's really a question before that, which is what is your pedagogical purpose? So, mm. so your zero with order question is, why pedagogically are you using this? Like, why is this the right example? Why are you critiquing it? What are you trying to do? And as Will says, that's a question that professors are really well suited to answer. Yes. There's another question that was um, buried in this question in sort of the depths of it that I think is really important too, which is for people who aren't lawyers but support OER creation, how are they supposed to use this document to sort of give legal advice? And that's a trick question because you shouldn't, right? <laughs> this document is not a law degree in a box, even for the sort of narrow questions of fair use for creating OER. But what it is, is um, a co-presenter on one of our earlier, earlier webinars said that much in the same way that if someone comes to you with a medical question, you give them resources, not answers. I think similarly here, um, you know, if people come to you with legal questions, you can say, well, this is a tool, it's been vetted, here are the communities that use it, here's the history of these tools, and we can sort of work through this together and I can help you understand the process and the terms in this tool, but that the author themselves, the person who knows their pedagogical purpose is still going to be the person making that determination. And if you want to, you know, if you're, if you're trying to persuade someone that, that, that they ought to take this journey with you, um, you can also point out that in the 15 or so years that we've been doing this, best practices, statements, and codes with different practice communities, people just don't get in trouble. You know, it's, it, it, um, it seems, it seems to, to lead people to places where 
not only do they feel good about the choices they've made, but no one else seems to be interested in challenging those choices. So you, you can go through this, this reasoning process to, I think, a place of greater confidence and greater comfort. So as Peter points out, um, communities have been uh, very supportive and embracing of the code and have been very successful. And I think part of the takeaway from that is that what the code is doing is embracing mission for these communities. And to keep that in mind is that it's very supportive and helps mission be accomplished as we move forward. Um, and that works for OEM and it's worked for all the communities that have already embraced the code. I think that's a very good point. Thank you, Prue. Um, there's another question in the chat I want to address briefly because it, it sort of speaks to our future plans. There's a question that says, you know, fair use is a pretty complicated topic. What suggestions do you have for sort of clearly teaching OER and creators and remixers about fair use without overwhelming them? Um, and I think one of the answers there is um, that this code as it stands right now is a sort of big umbrella that it is written to encompass practices in first grade ELA and in college level physics. And so it does require a little work to sort of dig in and think through about your own teaching practices and how they fall into these categories. But a lot of the work that we hope to do as a project, but I also think will happen for individual creators and projects like a textbook creation projects is understanding the small number of types of fair uses. Uh, like if you're creating a uh, art history textbook, you might want to be using a lot of similar types of images for a similar purpose or in a history textbook, you might be doing that or in a media studies class. And that once you have sort of sat down and dug into the specific examples that come up in your pedagogy, that the analysis gets a lot easier, that you're not doing it from first principles each time. And so you aren't necessarily asking creators to understand the whole universe of fair use so much as the cases that they run into over and over again. Will, do you maybe want to talk about that question too? Sure. Well, while I'm refreshing myself, what question two is, I'll, I'll also say some of our work over the next year or two is going to be working with people to create models of <laughs> good practice with the best practices, right? Yeah. Um, so what does it look like for a college physics professor to implement these in different ways? Um, so question two asks about include, including graphs and charts from an in-copyright work in the OER. Um, it's a recurrent question, and, and it sort of begs the sub-question what does your graph or chart look like? A lot of graphs and charts that I see get to that zeroth level question that we hit in a couple of the principles where if, if this is just a, you know, an alphabetical list of something, this is the presidents from first to most recent, um, because that's factual, that's not protected by copyright in the first place. Um, and even if it's, you know, colorful or something, there, there's what Peter used the term thin copyright. There's only sort of a, a tiny modicum in the selection and arrangement of those materials. Um, so, so a certain percentage of graphs and charts are, hooray, I don't even have to get to fair use. This isn't even a fair use question. This is just a use it and move on with my life sort of question. Um, in cases where there are copyrightable elements or components, um, I, I, there are a couple of solutions offered here. Redraw it with added value, obtain permission, or find something else with a CC license. Obviously, if there is an openly licensed version, that's a very simple way to address the issue. And if it's your friend down the hall who did it and they can give you permission, that's a simple way to do it as well. Um, but generally speaking, I would say that that because the copyright is non-existent or thin, um, you're, you're in pretty good space. Another theme we sounded in a lot of the conversations is one of fair use's great values is it can sort of sand off the weird philosophical edges of things. Is this a de minimis use? Is this not protected by copyright? Is this a sena faire? All these weird lawyer terms, right? 
fair use kind of cuts through a lot of that complexity and says, well, whatever, you know, however many angels can dance on the head of a pen, you can do it is sort of the short answer in this case. Um, is, is that confusing enough? Do other folks want to add, add nuance or, or context to? No, I think that's a, a good explanation. I think it's, it's just really, really important to remember that the, the valuable part of a, of a chart or a graph is the, its informational content. And that informational content is beyond the reach of copyright. And so a, a, a graph that, that simply but effectively presents a, a set of data is very, very unlikely to enjoy the kind of copyright protection that one has either to worry about at all or will have any difficulty working around. Not so much through adding value as through making sure that whatever little sort of irrelevant artistic flourishes may characterize the original do not appear in your version thereof. We had a lengthy discussion about those pain charts, like four or five different focus groups spent yeah. almost the entire time talking, you know, <laughs> that if you go to the doctor, it's a, a smile versus more of a more right. of a grimace. Um, we, we love the angels dancing on the head of a pen question, but the short answer is exactly as Peter said. I think we're coming to the end of our time. I wanted to see Peter, Prue, if either of you had any final thoughts and then turn it over to Barb to do a few last updates. Um, I would just, would just say, I, I see that there's an issue here about the boundless case and we can't really go into great depth here. Maybe we could do more of that on a future program, but, but I do want to make a very important point about this. And that is, this, the, the, what you're really dealing with in a case of a litigation of that kind is, is a situation in which someone valued their copyright interests very highly, and brought a lawsuit on that basis, and someone else chose not to contest. This is not an adjudicated case. This is not a case where a court decided anything about the scope of protection in the organization of textbooks. This is, of course, a case in which in which Boundless sort of poked the bear, the bear sort of, you know, stirred and, and growled, and Boundless seems to have figured out a way of settling it that leaves them with a viable business model. And it, it teaches, in effect, nothing. I think that's, that's a pretty good place to close, that there can be a there can be things that are done out there for lots of non-copyrighted reasons and that perhaps yeah. it's important not to draw the wrong conclusions from those. And perhaps, Peter, um, it also leads us to this answer that there is really very little litigation about this. In fact, because the risk here is not just to, you know, there's sort of this idea that litigation is a one-sided risk. Oh no, someone might sue me. But in fact, there's a really big risk, I think, to publishers and to others to, to getting really bad decisions on this. This is not controversial. And people are not actually given to, to that sort of act. Often one ought to think about the kind of thing that went on in that case, that is a provocative action, a response, a settlement, as a kind of business negotiation carried on by other means, rather than as a legal determination per se. Another way of making the same point is, or a similar point, is that sometimes we find that people confuse and perfectly good justification um, cease and desist letters with lawsuits. They're really very different things. Cease and desist letters exist. They're out in the world. They're easy to send. Um, but Sending one is or doesn't generate any of the same risk considerations for the rights holder that actually filing a lawsuit does. So sometimes people have said, oh, well, I, my colleague was sued for that. And then I ask, well, that's interesting. What was the, you know, what court? Well, no, they got a letter. Very different proposition. We're not going to stop all cease and desist letters. But I think that if people, embrace and stick with codes like this one and 
get to robust defensible conclusions about what they're doing, we can pretty much assure that there isn't going to be much more in the way of lawsuits. On that note, Great. Well, thank you so very much, Prue, Peter, Meredith, and Will for providing us with this deep dive into the code and really situating it within the context of how our community members can best engage with the tool. Um, I think it's exciting in so many ways, but particularly that piece about how the overlap between the core values of the code and how those align with our OEN guiding principles was really great. And needless to say, we're going to have lots to talk about in our two follow-up forums, which as Karen has Karen mentioned at the beginning are happening on Wednesday, April 21st and Wednesday, May 12th, both during the same time period from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Central. Um, and I will send out the recording for this session via the Google group, as well as reminders leading up to those sessions. And just wanna thank you all for attending. Thanks again to our presenters for sharing your work with us today and we'll see you all in April. Great, thank you all so much. Thanks everyone.